the oil tonight. I'm not giving out the prayers for the wall. I'm not giving you any red cords. I'm giving you nothing tonight but the word. <laughs> nothing but. All right. And I want you to open your Bibles and follow along with me. We'll begin with that familiar Psalm 23. that say amen. amen all right now in Psalm 23 let's read uh, beginning with uh, verse 1 and we'll read down through verse 4 come on let's read the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want he maketh me to lie down in green pastures he leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Now, let's stop and back up. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Will you look at somebody and just say that? I will fear, I will fear no, no evil. That's the thought that I want you to take home with you on tonight. I will fear no evil. Now the word evil here really means danger. Hello somebody. And I think that it is a well-established fact that the time in which we live is a time filled with danger. Many churches are beginning now to have uh, divine protection services. Uh, and most of it is in lieu of what happened September the 11th. This is something that we started doing, I don't know how many years ago, somewhere between 15 and 20 years ago. Because even at that time, I noticed the fact that at this time of the year, that the streets became more dangerous. Not only the streets where rapings and uh, muggings and purse snatchings and all of that was accelerated, but it's also a time when there are more domestic fires, houses that uh, the weather begins to cool and people are going uh, shopping and doing things and being a little careless. And many times, uh, sometimes it's only because the, the heating apparatus hasn't been properly checked out. And while people are asleep, homes catch fire. It is a time of the year when there is much danger. But now today when we think about danger, we think about uh, Afghanistan. We think about our nation being at war. We look at the recent outbursts in the Middle East where Israel uh, and those uh, Arab settlements, Palestinian settlements, uh, 
tempers are flowering again and suicide bombers. And it is really something how a person can be brainwashed to the degree that they are willing to kill themselves in order to make sure that they take out some of their enemies. Life doesn't seem to mean very much. We're in danger in the airways, on the highways, in danger, even in our homes, danger. Even now children cannot go to school and feel safe because in the elementary and middle and high schools, life isn't worth very much because young people who have not even learned as yet what life is all about, they are flirting with death. The sad thing is that many times we look around and we wonder why. Well, I've lived long enough to know why. Uh, because when I first entered school in the first grade, back at uh, the age of uh, five years old, just a couple of weeks or so before my sixth birthday, the first thing that I was introduced to was the fact that in the school we had assembly. We read the Bible, we prayed, uh, we pledged allegiance to the flag, and we did all of that before going into our classes. Uh, but one woman one day saw the power that she could have by going before the courts of the nation and having prayer and Bible reading outlawed from the schools. And when prayer and Bible reading walked out, then drugs and knives and guns walked in. And since that time, even the schools are not safe. Danger is everywhere. The Apostle Paul said, I believe it is in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, that in the last days, perilous times would come. And the word perilous means dangerous. Uh, if you probe a little deeper, I believe Strong's Dictionary would refer to those times as not only being dangerous, but harsh, harsh times. Uh, times that uh, uh, people would not necessarily have any sympathy or any feelings toward uh, one another. Uh, it's a day when uh, people have put themselves me, you know, inhabits the throne. Sitting on the throne of our life is the one big I. Everything is about me. And it doesn't matter who I have to crush to get what I want. Everybody is so into self-worth. And self-worth, most people think, is measured in dollars and cents and will do anything just in order to make a buck. And really not to make it, but to take it. <laughs> you have it, so I'll take it. And now even when people go uh, this season of the year Christmas shopping, uh, that's an ordeal. I was sitting watching the television the other day when uh, uh, they said the day after Thanksgiving, that Friday, is supposed to be the busiest shopping day of the year. And uh, they showed people who had been lined up from uh, 2 or 3 a.m. waiting on the Walmart store to open so they could uh, cash in on all of the uh, sales and all of the, uh, you know, supposedly goodbyes that were there. And they showed one woman, a lady evidently stepped in front of her. She balled up her fist and threatened her and started using uh, language that they had to bleep it out. Uh, and all of this is celebrating the joyful season. You never know where danger is. We are living in dangerous times. I believe the Apostle Paul talked about in 2 Corinthians 11 uh, that even the preaching of the gospel exposed him 
to so many dangers. Uh, let, let me just turn that for a minute. Second Corinthians 11, and I believe it's in verse 26. Uh, he says concerning uh, his plight in journeying often. He said, I did a lot of traveling, but my traveling brought me in to danger. He uses the word peril, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. In other words, Paul said, everywhere I turn, and I was a gospel preacher, but I'm still running into danger everywhere. We are living in dangerous times, but I wish you to look at somebody and say it like you really mean it, but I will fear no evil. Hallelujah. Turn to Psalm 27. The psalmist speaks not only in the generalities, but he speaks in many specifics concerning the dangers that he will not fear. Psalm 27, come on and read it with me, beginning with verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Now, you've got to understand that every time you see the word salvation, it does not always mean being saved from sin. The word salvation means deliverance. And here it means deliverance from danger. That it may be dark, but even when I'm walking in the darkness, the Lord is my light. And he is my deliverance. And since I know that God is my light and he is my deliverer, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to what? To eat up my flesh, they stumble and fail. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear, though war should rise against me. And this is the thing now that has so many people troubled because since the uh, September 11th uh, episode, we have been really in war, uh, at war uh, with the Al-Qaeda network with the Taliban government of uh, Afghanistan and now that thing is spreading and they are discovering that they are not all over there that many of them are right here and the war we don't know how many ways it will uh, exemplify itself uh, we don't know if uh, there is going to be a wholesale release of biochemicals, or whether there is going to be an extension of the terrorist activity where suicide groups will blow themselves up in an effort to kill other Americans. We don't know where this whole idea of war will lead. But David said, even though war should rise against me in this will I be confident I'll be confident in the fact that the Lord is my light and that he is my deliverer uh, it doesn't matter what happened and a lot of things may happen but he says in the midst of everything that might come against me I will be confident in the fact that the Lord is my light and the Lord is my salvation. I wish somebody would say again, I will fear no evil, not even the evil of war. 
Uh, turn to Psalm 46. I told y'all this, this night has never been about preaching. It's about letting you walk through the scriptures to be reminded of the promises that we have from God concerning his protection. All right, look at Psalm 46. David even says, I, I won't fear uh, natural disasters. Psalm 46, come on, read. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. He's really talking about times of quaking earth, earthquakes, waters roaring, tidal waves. It doesn't matter what happens. He says we do not have to fear. How did Paul say it when he talks to Timothy? He said, now God has not given us the spirit of fear. Look at somebody and ask him, did you know that fear is a spirit? That's what it is. It's a spirit. And, and when the spirit of fear grips you, not only are you afraid to get on the airplane, Next thing you know, you'll be afraid to get in the automobile. And then you'll be afraid to leave the house. And you'll also be afraid to stay in the house. <laughs> because the spirit of fear will lock you in. And then when everybody else has to leave, and little popping noises that mean nothing during the sunshine, In the dead of night, no, they just say the house is settling and you hear something popping and you know that somebody is in there with you. And it's nothing but a spirit of fear. I've seen the spirit of fear take a hold of people to the degree that they were afraid of everything and everybody. Afraid of every situation. And if you allow that to happen to you before you know it, your very mind will deteriorate. But God has not given us the spirit of fear, but instead of fear, he's given us what? Power, love, and a sound mind. That simply means that as long as you walk in the spirit of power and walk in the spirit of love, thou keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusted in thee. Trusting in him brings you into the power of God. Trusting in him and walking in love makes you walk confidently. But fear and hatred will make you lose your mind. A lot of folk today are cracking up and they don't even know why. Some of them are so full of hatred until. You know. And the sad thing about folk who are full of hatred, and, and how did that get in here but it's in. <laughs> sad thing about people who are full of hatred the fact is, it never affects the person that is supposed to be the object. They go on about their merry way, having a good time. And the person who's full of hatred sitting up there being eaten away like a cancer that's just eating them up on the inside. And it's not just sinner folk. You got a whole lot of hateful folk that's supposed to be saved. 
sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost and a mighty burning fire. But when Paul talked to Timothy, he said, fear is a spirit. And God didn't give you the spirit of fear. So if he's given you power against fear, and then he's given you love, then love is to combat hate. Hello? And as long as you can walk in love and walk in power, you don't have to worry about hatred and you don't have to worry about fear because hate is evil. And I will fear. Oh, somebody ought to give God some praise in here right now. I'm getting close to being finished. Come on over now to Psalm 91. Oh, I love this one. We spoke from this even the night of September the 11th on that Tuesday night. Psalm 91. You have it? Come on and read it with me. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. Now listen at the way the psalmist uh, phrases this. Here is a man that is acquainted with war and he knows that a defensed city has a better chance of keeping out the enemy than a city that has no walls or that has no gates. A city that is just open out there in the plain can more easily be taken and pillaged than one that has taken the time to build a wall and make itself a fortress. So he said, you may look at me and think that there is no protection. There's nobody shielding me. But I'll say of the Lord that he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. It, it reminds me of the time when the prophet Elisha had gone down to the little city called Dothan. And there in the city of Dothan, king of Syria would set traps for the king of Israel. And every time the king of Israel would get ready to go with his uh, party, his entourage, king of Syria would uh, set a trap. And the prophet, God would reveal to him the plot. And he would get word to the king of Israel and said, don't go that way because the Syrians will be waiting on you. And time after time, they set the trap, but it didn't work. And finally, the king of Syria called in all of his generals, his wall council, and said, one of you is a traitor. Which one of you is for my enemies? Said, Not any of us. He said, no, that, that's a prophet in Israel. And he not only hears what you say in the war council, but he hears what you say in your bedchamber. Finally, they decided they would catch him, and he was down in a place called Dothan. Early that morning, the servant of the prophet gets up, 
It's in the book of 2 Kings. And the servant is getting ready, preparing things for when the prophet gets up so he could have his meal prepared and all of the things that the servant would do. But he looked out and saw all of those enemy chariots and horses that had surrounded the city. And he said, alas, O man of God, how shall we do? In other words, you know what? We are trapped. We are caught. The king of Syria has a host and there's no way for us to escape. And the old prophet looked out with eyes of faith and experience. One thing to have faith is another thing to have had some experience with God. And the prophet wasn't even troubled. So he goes into prayer. But he doesn't go into a panic type of prayer. Oh God, I'm in trouble. My life is in danger. Please help me. Now, he didn't panic because he knew he had help. He knew that he had a fortress. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. So his prayer is not for his safety, but his prayer is for his scared servant's eyes to be opened. His prayer is simply, Lord, open this young man's eyes. He's looking at the visible. I want to see the invisible. He's looking at the enemy, but I want him to see those that are on our side. He's looking only with the natural eye, the carnal eye, but I want him to look with an eye of faith. God answered the prophet's prayer and opened the young man's eye, and he looked again. And instead of seeing just the army of Syria that has surrounded the city, between the house and the army of Syria was another army. See, you have to get the picture of that. The Syrians surrounded the whole city. But God sent his army and they were in the inner circle. They were between the house and the army of the enemy. So that the only way that the enemy could get to the prophet, he had to break through the army of God. I'm trying to tell you something that when God is your refuge and your fortress, he surrounds you. And the enemy can't get to you unless he breaks through God's defense. And don't you know that's not a devil big enough and bad enough to break through the defense that God has around his people. We didn't go any further into Psalm 46, but when David got through talking about the Lord, you know, therefore shall we not fear, though the earth be removed, though the mountains shake, he goes on to talk about God is our refuge and our strength. Hallelujah. He's the one, like the mountains are round about Jerusalem. He says, so the Lord is round about them that fear him. So fear him, but fear no evil. Because if you fear him, the enemy can't get to you without breaking through divine defenses. Let's read just a little bit further. Verse 3, I'm still in Psalm 91. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. Now he's telling you two things that God will deliver you from. First of all, the fowler is the one who traps birds. Fowl referring to fowl of the air. And a fowler learns how to set a trap to catch a bird. Um, no, I don't think I want to tell you that. But uh, 
my building engineer over there, Brother Spike, we, we were trying to wonder what in the world could we do? To, because that white and gold building, the, the, the roof, just all messed up from the hundreds of pigeons bedding there every night. And we live in a world now that is more uh, animal conscious than human. Yeah. You got a better chance of getting locked up for killing a dog than for killing a person. Oh yeah. This is a day when the, the animal preservationists, they are concerned about any kind of animal life but they don't care much about human life. And uh, everything that I suggested, they say, we can't do that. So we, we did manage to find a fowler. <laughs> yeah. That's all I said about that. The fowler is the one who has skill in trapping birds. Satan makes the mistake of looking at you and me as though we are simply a sparrow or maybe a robin. So he sets his traps. He doesn't understand that God has made his people eagles. It's a little difficult to trap an eagle. Number one, his wing spread is too wide to go in the cage. Another thing about it, he flies so high that he doesn't even mess around in the lowlands where the other birds are. The psalmist says, he'll deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. I wish you'd look at somebody and tell them it doesn't matter how many traps the enemy sets for you. God will deliver you from the fowler's traps. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. He'll deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. Now, this is talking really about um, disease that comes with such proportion as it is in epidemic proportion. It's talking about serious epidemics. It's talking about plagues. And we're living in a time now when that's what you're hearing in the news. You're hearing about Afghanistan, bombs dropped in Afghanistan, and you're hearing about anthrax here in the United States. And they're talking about the possibility that in an all out biochemical war that they can release smallpox and all kind of disease and people will die and you won't even know it's happening until people begin to drop dead and you can sit there and watch what they're talking about in the news and uh, if you don't watch yourself you become obsessed with it and looking at it day and night and it's not going to be anything that's going to change. You're watching to see what's next, but after you watch it three or four hours, you see it's the same thing going over and over, and you keep on listening to that, and the next thing, fear will grip you. But God has already anticipated anything that man can do. He's saying whatever the noisome pestilence may be, no matter what kind of plague is released upon society, it does not matter how many epidemics, anthrax, smallpox, whatever else, he shall do what? Deliver thee 
from the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. Read a little further. When it comes, how will it miss me? Verse 4, he shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shall thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. Said it doesn't matter whether it happens in the middle of the day, like it did September the 11th, or whether it happens in the middle of the night. It doesn't matter how it comes, the hour flying by day or the terror by night. And it is true that many will die, but verse 7 says what? A thousand shall fall at thy side and 10,000 at thy right hand. But it shall not come nigh thee. Some of us, everything that happened, we, there's a flu epidemic. Uh oh, I know I'm going to get it. Everything that happened, we just know it's gonna happen to us. But you gotta start looking at who you are. You are the particular treasure of God. You are his peculiar treasure. He says a whole lot of things can happen. Epidemic proportion. But it doesn't have to kill you. Oh, I know some of y'all, you're not even listening, you. But if you ever catch a hold to God's word, all of the stuff that the enemy is using, trying to infiltrate your mind, you will get up and say, I will fear no evil. Doesn't matter what's going on. I've got confidence in God and I will fear. Well, I'm getting ready to close. Oh, somebody ought to give him some praise right about now. Glory to Jesus. Oh, come on and give him praise. Hallelujah. 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 My, 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 my. Oh, bless his name. Bless his name. Thank you. Mm. Oh, bless his name. <laughs> Glory to God. Let's go back again to Psalm 23. And I'm going to bring it home. David himself was a shepherd. Were it not for the shepherd, sheep would be destroyed. They say that sheep are really dumb animals. That they can start eating in a green pasture. But they can eat along beside the fence and if there's a hole, they can eat their way right through the hole in the fence and never be able to find their way back. sheep did not have a shepherd he would go astray 
and be at the mercy of the elements. I can remember 1961 when my parents, we were yet living in Detroit, my parents went on the Holy Land tour. My father tried his best to get me to go, but I had no desire to go then, still have no desire to go. Uh, I'll get to Jerusalem when uh, Jesus comes. And we, he steps upon Mount Zion. And when he ruled the nations with a rod of iron and men beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks to study war no more. That's the day that I want to be in Jerusalem. I'm not really concerned about going before then. But they were on this uh, trip, the uh, World Conference of Pentecostal Churches was being held. And my father wanted to learn all that he could in the Holy Land. He came upon some Eastern shepherds and asked some questions about the relationship between the shepherd and the sheep. One question, is it true? Do you really know all of these sheep by name? And the shepherd said, oh yes, I know them all by name. Well, someone said, why don't you call one of them? And he stretched out his hand to whosoever it was in the crowd and said, give me something. Food costs money. He said, and I never call my sheep unless I've got something to give them. A little later on, they came to a sheep fold. It was just an enclosure, but it had no fence. It had no door. Because the shepherd's method was that he would lead the sheep and that he himself would step into the fold and walk around the perimeter where the fence was. And after walking around, then the sheep would follow. And then he'd get back to the entrance. And someone asked the shepherd, where is the door? He said, when it's time to retire, I stretch out in the door because I am the door. That if the sheep are going to get out, they've got to come over me. If the wolf is going to get in, he's got to come over me. Oh, you don't hear what I'm saying. If you are a sheep in his fold, the wolf can't get in where you are. Without coming by the shepherd. And don't forget, my shepherd is the Lord. Hallelujah. David says he's the shepherd for his sheep. But David understood that although I am the shepherd of these sheep, I myself am a sheep. And I got to have a shepherd. I got to have somebody to protect me from that which I cannot protect myself. Lord is my shepherd. I don't have to go wanting or lacking of anything. Oh, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Glory to God. Leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. Leads me in the path of righteousness. And not because I'm so good, but simply because I belong to him. For his name's sake. Do you understand that some things we enjoy not because of any goodness of our own, but just because we belong to him? Praise God. 
I, I look over at my wife and you know a lot of people talk about she's uh, such a well-dressed person and she is uh, and uh, but a whole lot of things that I buy for her not because she asked uh, uh, not because of anything other than the fact she represents me. I, I hope you hear what I'm saying. Look at somebody and tell them, if you are called by his name, you represent him. Oh, glory to God. He's going to protect you for his own name's sake. You belong to him and he can't let the devil have you, but he shields you for his own name's sake. He blesses you for his own name's sake. He shields you from danger for his own name's sake. Oh, don't try to pin no flowers on you. It ain't about you. He does it for his own name's sake. 